Hello, everyone. I do want to refresh your memories that we uh, talked about qualities of an estimate. We defined an error as the difference between an estimate and what you're trying to estimate that you claim is the truth. Both of those things are random variables because we think of the truth as something characterized by distribution. And we think of the estimate typically as based on data which are characterized by distribution. We define the bias then as the difference of the average estimate compared to the true property that you want to estimate. The variance is the traditional notion. The variance of an estimate is the average squared distance of it to its average. And by average, I mean expectation now. I do not mean, you know, then divide because that's just generally the notion. The mean squared error is exactly what that says, is the mean of the square of the error. Uh, putting two and two together reveals that the mean squared error is the sum of variance and the bias squared. I then launched into a philosophical discussion of what it means to be good. Unbiased is a measure of goodness. Low variance is a measure of goodness. Consistency is how your estimators improve the rate at which and to which degree when you uh, keep trying it, when you keep adding things. In the case where you do things with n numbers, then you want your variance of whatever you're estimating to get better as n goes large. You want your estimators to have minimum mean squared error. That is almost universally the definition of good in the statistical sense. What's an efficient estimator? One that reaches the minimum mean squared error. You may only reach it at n equals infinity, but it's got to be reachable. There is a lot of theory about these sorts of estimators, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of notions of what the theoretical best is that are based on this property. Whether or not you can get there is another question. The rate at which you get there is another question, but it's on this page. Those are the three or four notions that come up when we talk about the quality of estimators. And then I give you a curve, a sort of a trade-off curve, which is gonna come back in almost everything that we do, that you're always given and taking and often the price you pay for a desirable lowering of the estimation variance of not being all over the place with your guesswork or estimation work is that you pay that price by slightly biasing the result. So very often the minimum mean squared error estimator is a biased estimator that has a low variance such that the combination of variance and bias give you the minimum mean squared error. And it always pays to look at that. So that's a question to ask for anything you do. What's the variance? What's the bias? What's the mean squared error? And here I illustrated it in some hypothetical axis of you doing something and it's going to become a lot clearer when we actually do do something. And so always think of a target shooting in terms of bias and variance and always be prepared to defend your estimators in terms of what they do. Really high precision, well, maybe biased, but you know, if you know it, that's really useful. High variance is really not a good estimator often, but you know, maybe low bias is what you say, you know, lots of data and the rate at which it decays is gonna get better anyway. So, you know, maybe it's all right. This could be all right. You no, know, low variance, low bias, that's clearly really good. You're shooting well. High bias and high variance, you're going to have a hard time convincing people it's a good estimator, unless you again make a rate argument um, uh, of how that thing improves. It is now important to not be the mathematician, but to be a practical person. I have uh, so many mathematician friends who are saying, and my estimator converges to the truth. And then I rhetorically ask, yeah, but at what rate? And then they say, well, you know, at infinity. And I'm like, well, then you lost me. How? Because I don't have an infinite amount of data. I work with finite sets. And so ask yourself those questions. And we played with the words accuracy. Yes, bias. Bias is the thing that's statistically defined now. I'm not going to 
redefine that notion ever. It's variance, unlike to ever define it. One may mix up those terms, especially in common language, but right now they are mapped onto accuracy and precision. We are going towards characterizing sampling distributions. And since I haven't written the word, I'm gonna write the word here. What can we learn by looking at the distributions of things that we do on samples of populations? Before we characterize any distribution, we're gonna know that distributions have expectations and variances. Lecture one, locations, spreads, shapes, we didn't talk about it last week, last lecture. But yeah, they're going to have expectations and variance. So what's the simplest things we can begin with? Well, it is to take an estimator of something we want to know and ask what its expectation is, therefore its bias, and what its variance is, therefore its precision. The very simplest thing that you can think of is the population of the human height and you taking one human at a time, one experiment, one random doctor, one random ruler at a time, and making a sample of that. And out of the infinite number, out of the population, in other words, which you don't even count, you take a bag of humans, 100, that's N. And then you're going to say, well, every one of them, one human, is a draw from that population. The next human is a draw from that population. That's an identically distributed variable, an independently distributed variable, an IID set. In other words, if I take a bag of 20 or I take 10 bags of 20, then I have the notion of that every one of them and every element of them is a sample drawn from that population. So that's back to what it really means to be a random variable and how a sample could be one thing, but also a bag of things or a bag of bags. And uh, it doesn't matter here because we're only saying there is a population of human height that we want to know. And whatever we pick out of it is going to be identically independently distributed. Simplest example, what is the human height just about in terms of a location? its expectation, well, I'm gonna average numerically, arithmetically, my bag of human lengths by adding them up and dividing them. Then we must always ask for any proposed estimator like this one, how good is it? I'm gonna do bias, I'm gonna do variance, I'm gonna sum and square the things. So the bias worked through linearity, worked through the fact that, yep, they're all from the same parent distribution and you're seeing that, uh-uh, that is indeed exactly what you want to know. On the average, you're going to be right on that. This is an unbiased estimator. Knowing that, the formula for how to figure its variance quickly reveals itself because you write down what the variance should be. You substitute the thing you just knew that the expectation of your estimator is the truth. That makes that thing a little simpler. You rewrite it if you want, as the variance of the thing that you just done. You recognize that as a linear combination of random variables that we have done two lectures ago. We know their IID, which means there's no covariance terms. We know the variance is a quadratic operator, so there's a thing that squares. And then we know that that thing that we square actually is given by our setup of the problem by saying, well, it came out of a population with the known variance, and so we substitute that. So. These arrows are beautifully drawn, if I might say so, but also independent lines of this argument, right? This connects to that. The IID-ness plays, the sum plays, and the fact that you have a term that you know what it is, that's the third leg of this thing. Then you end up with that important formula that I'm sure you recognize that if you take experiments in your ideal good way, which means every one of them doesn't depend on the other and it's all trying to do measure the same thing. Again, that's IID, that the precision of your estimate, the variance of your estimate decays as one over the size of the elements in your sample, the N elements in your bag. And yes, as N goes to infinity, 
your estimator has no more variance, which means it's got to be the truth, the truth. And your estimator ends up at the truth, which we already knew. And now we know the rate, and that's the optimal rate that you can get of anything. So if somebody tells you, talk to me about one over n, and it's sort of vaguely related to statistics class, you're gonna know that this is about how close to having the optimal rate of decay for your estimators are you going to be in terms of the number of samples that you try because most things don't decay at this rate. This one does and that's why it's a canonical example. Then somebody says, is there a notion of M where, you know, what's the sample, right? I have a bag of N humans and you like, yeah, you know, if you wanna think about having M bags of N humans, then those are samples, but it's all identically distributed. And so we are just talking about what happens when you take one sample of N humans, one bag of N such measurements. And if I ask for its expectation and its variance, if you want to make a mental step of saying, well, it's like I have N bags of N humans and let M go to infinity first before, you know, then, then you can talk yourself through that also. And read these two or three chapters from Bennett and Pearsall because I think they do a good job at, at arguing how to think about these things. And well, so now we know something about the expectation and the variance of one estimator of location. And I suppose then it is only natural that my next thing would be what should I expect? if I make a variance estimate. And that is what I'm gonna I'll walk you through now. I'm gonna box that appropriately. This is A, an estimator for the mean and its quality. Continued. B, an estimator for the variance. I now have you mentally write down the integral or the averaging brackets and saying it's the expectation of the squared distance of the thing to the expectation of the thing. Or that was the integral of that thing times the PDF of that thing. And then I'm going to just write this as gonna be sigma squared half of some variable x in the same condition as before. I'm going to keep my colors from before. And well, what will you want to do? You will want to take your sample and compare it to the, um, I'm going to backtrack my words here a little bit. You have a bag of humans, period. You have just gone through the exercise of making an estimator for the location, and that's your n hat of x. I want to just shortcut this next thing here and say, I'm gonna start writing something that should be reasonable to estimate the expectation of the squared distance of things with respect to their expectations. And I'm just going to substitute the thing from A and say, okay, you have just done your estimate for the location, that's mu hat of X. I'm not going to write one over m, sum over m, you know, then you'll have too many variables and dummies and some, some dummy variables and summation signs, you might get confused. So you've just already done that, okay? You don't know the truth, but you got an estimate. And on top of that, you have an unbiased and consistent and efficient estimate. So that's a good choice. And then I'm going to square that. And then I'm going to sum that over all the human measurements in my bag. And then we're going to divide that in order to average that. So this is my proposed estimator for the variance. And I'm going to box it. I think it's important to know that you're going to have a lot of codes and software and talks and papers where people will point to this and say, that's the variance. 
that is not acceptable here in this class, right? When we say is, we're only really ever referring to the truth, to the values pertaining to the population. And so when I say that is the expectation, that's an unknowable truthy thing. That is the variance, that's the unknowable population uh, uh, value. And so this is not the variance, this is an estimate for the variance of a population, okay? Other people, other textbooks would say that's the sample variance, but then that leads to sample being dropped and people saying that's the variance. I know, I don't wanna call it that. I say that's my estimator for the variance, okay? So I'm gonna keep my same notation and I'm gonna ask the one question you should always ask, how good is that? And before fully characterizing this distribution, which, you know, we're not too far off from being able to do, we're going to just say, all right, going to the motion. What is the bias of that thing? What is the B, the bias of that estimator for the sigma squared? Okay, so I'm not going to write down the derivation, but that is in the note, because in the interest of time, Everything you need to carry this through is in your handwritten notes, because I know they're on my sheets. They're also in the notes that I sent you. And what we end up with after a long calculation or a short calculation, depending on how quick you are, is that this bias, the bias of this estimator is not zero. If you do the calculation, you'll see that it is biased, I'm, just, I'm restating it, okay? So what is the amount of bias? It turns out it is n minus one over n, which is close to one, which means close to being unbiased, which also leads people to say, if you're worried about one, your n is not large enough and you then might ignore it. However, knowing exactly what that bias is and then saying, okay, well, so what I, all I need to do is to subtract one from here. And then when I do it, I get a zero bias. And clearly that's what the best estimator is because that's an unbiased estimator. So the long story, Ben that and Peter talks about it, I rewrite it in the notes, it's like everywhere also, is this estimator when doing this formula exactly is unbiased thanks to the minus one correction, okay? So then most people will just say, here is the N variance estimator or the N minus one variance estimator, check your code. I'm in an area where N is large, I can afford to ignore it. Many of you, especially in experimental science, you know, when you're doing 12 replicates, your N is not large. So the N minus one corrects that estimator to being unbiased. Surprisingly few books take you through it. It's like you're not smart enough to do with it. And then they hand away some argument about it, but it's very quickly shown that you don't do it. You get a factor of N over N minus one. And so you just multiply the right things out and you get this thing up. Okay, then it's unbiased. That's all right. That means you're doing the right thing on average. Success. Next question, what is the variance of the variance estimate? If you haven't said these words in the same sentence, I know to some people that is a bit of a notion that they need to get used to what do you mean the variance the variance? No, I mean the variance of the variance estimate. Okay, how variable is your variance estimate? Back to the bag of humans. If I take a bag of 100 humans and their expectation is five feet, and then I take another bag of humans and their average is 5.1, and then another bag of humans and it's 4.9 and so on. Well, I know that if I average the averages, that I get the average. And I also knew from the previous sheet that the variability of those averages is directly related to N, is directly related to the variance of the population, and it's single squared over N. So take a bigger bag, that 
variability and your mean estimate is going to be lower. Same thing here. Take a bag of humans, calculate their sample variance, use that as a measure for what you think the population value will be. You do that, you'll be right on average. The bias doesn't depend on n. Okay, yes, we're not going to make n equals one. That'd be stupid, right? There's no variance estimator if you only have one thing. You need two. You do not want to divide by one over zero. But the bias of this estimator is not dependent on it, just like the bias of the location estimator is not dependent on it. Now we're asking what is the variance of this estimator. And here too, you do ultimately a simple calculation. It's simple because it involves grade school, middle school, let's say, squares and sums. It's just long and I don't want to do it, but I'm just going to write this for you. And I'm also going to hark back to two or three lectures ago where, for this reason, I wrote down the general definition of a moment. Remember that? That's going here. And so I told you the zeroth moment is just the math. That's one. That's the first moment with respect to zero is the expectation. The second moment with respect to the first moment with respect to zero is the variance. And then I told you, you can do three and four and n infinity. And they have names like skewness and kurtosis and so on. So I want to reuse that to give you just a result of asking what is the variance of the variance and knowing that all it does is required some tedious sums, which Wikipedia does for you and Math World does for you. And if you Google it, you'll go it. And then if you do it, you haven't really learned anything. So I'm just giving you the result. You end up with this scaling as one over n and depending on two moments with some factors, just the way it comes out, n minus three, n minus one, and color, 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 the fourth moment. I'm gonna use my same notation, but I'm gonna subvert, well, okay, no, I'm not gonna use the same notation, I'm gonna subvert a little bit. I'll say n four, and then I'll point to how it relates to the previous thing, and n two. And my slightly subverted new notation compared to page seven. Okay, here my M sub N is a shorthand for the nth moment, just like I was before, but only one little modification just for notational reasons. Gonna involve the PDF, P of X, gonna involve integration. Done with that. Remember the old definition? It said takes x and subtracts something. Maybe that was a little bit too cumbersome. But I do x, and when I subtract the actual expectation, m of x, then I have what's called a central moment, the central nth moment, where the notion of central means that Take a look, it's not just an arbitrary number, but it's the actual first moment with respect to zero, which itself is a crude or raw moment. I do not want to bore you with the terminology because I can barely remember it, but this here is the actual expectation, which you know is a first moment. And the bottom, bottom line is that I'm just changing my notation a little bit to make it all a little bit easier such that in this notation, what is M2, big M2? It's the variance. Yes, it is exactly the variance because if we go compare my notations and I didn't make a mistake, it's the second moment with respect to the central tendency, which is the first moment with respect to zero. And so I didn't bother writing the two indices on and I just switched to one. And so M2 is the second central moment is the variance. Uh, so, Frederick, I think you're missing a power of N in the expression. Yes, thank you very much. Here's my little N. Okay, so um, ugly formula. 
hard to guess for arbitrary distribution what the fourth moment is going to be. You can graph n minus three divided by n minus one and see where that's going. It's definitely related to the variance. So the variance of the variance estimate better be related to the variance. This is how it relates. So for the second time now, I'm gonna use the example of the normal distribution before having actually talked about it at all ever. And that's gonna come here. And then we will talk about the normal distribution, but I want to let the normal distribution be felt before it's introduced and be needed before it is wanted. And then it's gonna just arise organically. For normal distributions and possibly for broader classes, for symmetric distributions, for exponential distributions, that's all blah, blah theory. You all know the normal distribution. It's that bell curve, it's symmetric. You know the mean is the center. You know the mode is the maximum probability of it. It is in the center. You know the median is in the center. It's got so much symmetry that it is a boring distribution. For that normal distribution, which I haven't talked much about, again, M2 is just gonna be its actual variance, the thing we want to know. And M4 ends up being three times the variance squared. I'm not asking you ever as a homework or anywhere else to like derive that or write that. Again, it involves summing and squaring and being patient. And that's what it turns out to be. And these things are these days wonderfully tabulated on Wikipedia, which I'm gonna quickly verify out of the screen with you. If you type in Wikipedia distributions, you get this sort of a, a, a flashcard of it where it lists all sorts of moments. I'm gonna do normal distribution, which you should do on your own time. And then you get this thing. It says notation, parameters, PDF, CDFs, quantile, mean, median, mode, variance, skewness, kurtosis, blah, blah, blah. And it gives you all these various things. And so that's no longer really interesting for me to take you through. So in this case, that's what happens. And I want to end with that by simplifying that formula to assure you that in the case of the normal distribution, that variance of the variance estimate ends up being two over n minus one times the unknown thing that you want to estimate to the fourth power. Okay, so is it time to box this? I'm going to give it like one of those Egyptian frames. If there's anything you want to remember is that we've done bias and variance of estimators for the first and second moment of distributions according to the usual notions of what you think you should be doing. Arithmetic averaging, yes, that's great. Zero bias and a variance that is, that is related to the variance, but divided by N, which is a good sign. Next, an unbiased estimator for the variance, more or less corresponding what I'm sure you know that you should be doing, some square subtract. Don't forget the minus one, then you actually do get the zero bias. And then if you do more calculation, which I wouldn't wish upon you unless you're hardy. And the simplification, which you wish upon everyone, because it's just true and widely known. Then it turns out the variance of your variance estimate also decays nicely. So it's not as one over n, but as one over n minus one. But that's pretty good. And it's gonna be large and the decay is gonna be great. And it depends on the square of the thing that you want to know. As it probably should, right? Because itself, it's a squared type of property of a squared type of property. So if I didn't see a quadratic come out, I'd be slightly worried. Also, I think you're missing a square on the M2 in your expression for variance. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. We are interested in learning more about distributions. We're gonna need it in, you know, everything's cumulative, we're gonna need it all the time. So we've talked about combining variables 
and we know how to take their expectations and we know how to take their variances because we had the propagation formulas and the linearity and we've used it a number of times. So now I'm going to give you a more proper distributional way of looking at it. So I'm gonna simplify it to the simplest complicated case of a linear combination of variables. And you know, adding two variables is the simplest complicated case. Okay, so let there be an X and a Y and let them be a random variables. So now it is human height and head circumference. I call it X and Y. And we know that they exist. So they have a joint probability density distribution. And I'm interested in this some random variable, Z, is X plus Y. Human height exists, head circumference exists, the sum of human height and head circumference exists. What do we know about that? We already know about the mean and the variance because they're just linear combinations, so what is the distribution of that? Okay, let me just rewrite P of X and Y, that distribution that I have. Oh, my X came out too curly, but let it be. So P exists. And y is z minus x. So now I know a function, p, and I know it's two arguments. So if I want to know what the integral of this distribution is over all values of x, okay, take the probability of this joint thing and integrate out the other variable then I end up with the description of what the distribution is of z, because that's a variable that I did not integrate out of. Okay, so this is called, I don't think I have used the word yet, marginalization, which is out of a two-parameter distribution, integrating out over one of the variables until you get the function that is just in a single variable. Another word that's different in everyday language. That's called marginalization, okay, sure. Now I'm gonna make the additional thing and I'll say let X and Y be independent. Then we know from the definition of independent that the PDF of X and Y is gonna be a product of the PDFs of X and Y. And I'm not done and I'm gonna verify how I wrote it last time, the time, the time before. Yeah, I wrote it like this. There were no questions. You can find it this way, right? Because I've defined a function P of X and Y. I've defined a function P of X. I've defined a function P of Y. Here, right now, I think I'm going to make it more explicit by saying let the two distributions be different. And so I'm going to call them P1 of X as a function that could be, you know, whatever it is, and P2 of X as a function of Y. I just do not want to create a confusion that you say, uh oh, P is a thing, and therefore I know what it is. No, I now have three functions on the board a joint PDF, and I, through independence, know that it is a product function, and it could be the product of two different terms. Then it, that is a definition of independence. So with that, I will ask myself, what's my distribution that I get for Z now? I'm gonna sum it explicitly over, you know, all the possibilities. And so now I'll say, all right, cool. There's P1 of X, right? Must be. The second variable is Z minus Y. So that was Y. So or Z minus X, that was Y. So that's P2 of Z minus X. And then integrate over all the examples. So now this is the mathematical answer to, I've got two variables. I already know what their means are. I already know what their variances are. I also know what that is if they're independent. Their means are variances. I had the formulas in the previous lectures. I want to know about their distribution. So I say, fine, give me your distribution and I'll tell you what the sum variable is, you got to integrate something. Now, this could be hyper complicated, who knows, but that's how that will work. Special case, 
actually their joint PDF is a product of their individual PDFs as per independence to simplify things. In that case, I just stick it in and I end up with a formula that says multiply these two distributions and integrate them in this way. So now I want you to look at this and recognize this as a special type of integral that if you haven't heard before, have now heard before. Do you recognize anything about this integral that you think is noteworthy? This is a convolution. I'm going to say yes, write it here, and then I'm going to talk about it maybe more than you all care for. But let this be then the introduction of what is a convolution integral. It is an integral that has two functions and that combines their arguments in this way. I will talk more about convolution in a discrete sense, but I want to give you an example of how to use it, why we use it, and to make sense of it. And again, I'm going to try to do this in shorthand so I don't do too much. That ends up adding very little. I want to have a PDF for a certain X variable. And I want to have a PDF for a certain Y variable. And I want to know what the PDF will be of the sum variable. I really should be doing it this way. And so I'm going to give you the simplest example in the book. And I refer to Ben and Pierce because I think it's a great book and that's their example. So what are they saying? They're saying let P1 of X, let it be a uniform distribution on the interval zero to A and let P2 of Y, which again I said is potentially different function, but let it be also a uniform distribution between zero and A. Does it make sense to everyone immediately that the height of this thing is at one over a. Tell me why that makes sense that the height of that bar should be one over a. The product should be one. Yes, thank you, right? Everyone is like it needs to be a normalized distribution. Then I can get away with anything. I define my function as properly normalized, I'm done. So look at the Bendeth and Pearsall book. They walk us through and sometimes I do it in class and then I think we just do it talking without learning that much, so I'm shortening it a little bit here. It ends up separating when you apply this rule. You have to write this integral over the interval where it makes sense. And so you end up with two regimes and it ends up like this. It's going to be 1 over a squared z or 2a minus z a2 for when either z is smaller than a or when z is between a and 2a. Now, I just wrote this by copying on my own notes. My brain is not in it, okay? I can't make sense of this. I would have to walk myself and talk myself through and it would take 10 minutes for you to verify that. So go do that on your own time to make sure, oh, that's why right. this argument cannot be bigger than that and smaller than that. And so my integral limits change. That's the sort of stuff that presumably you have done tens of times in other classes, but um, you can walk yourself through it. Then I'm gonna draw it. And then I'm going to see that, well, look, one over a squared z. Now I have zero a and two a. And if my z is below a, it's a linear function in z, and between a and 2a for my z, when the formula as applied here must evaluate to this, which I integrated to that, it's a function that drops back down to zero because at 2a it's zero, right? And at a, it's 2a minus a is one over a. And you remember elementary school area calculations for the area of the triangle, base times height divided by two. And so that is a normalized distribution. Okay, so 
what do I want you to learn from this? Something ultimately important that's going to also come back in our second real project or homework, rather. So I'm going to pre-tell you a result that I want you to think about intuitively already that says the following. Well, if I keep adding variables, when I've just worked out the simplest complicated piece of two variables and I said, hey, that's a convolution in my illustration as well, two rectangles turn into a triangle when you convolve them. And again, I'm going to tell more about convolution. And if you haven't seen it before, it's a good time to read a little bit around it. But if my Z is X plus Y plus U and then plus V and so on, it stands to reason that I just need to keep convolving. I can group the terms, I start with x plus y, then I have the result, and I can involve it with another, with another, with another, with another. And so, um, let xi, the way I had it before, you know, now my, it's no longer a sample, now I'm, I'm again, using the notation of let x sub i be n random variables and let them all be mutually independent and therefore uncorrelated and then ask ourselves what is the distribution of the sum of these things okay. again special case of a linear combination of variables. Again, I told you what to make of their expectation and their variance covariance. Covariance equals zero in this case. We already know the moments of this thing, but now I'm asking more generally, what do I know about the distribution of this thing? Well, I know that. I need to convolve. Um, answer, just keep on convolving, and you'll get to it. Start with P of X of Y, then do P of X of Y plus 2, X1 plus 2 plus 3, X1 plus 3, and so on. So you keep convolving, and you get to the answer. From one to N. Example. Pictorially, well, two box cars turn into a triangle. I'm going to say that I'm going to introduce here the star for convolution as the operator. So I'll say, okay, I had two variables. I will now involve that with another variable. Over a. These are examples. Okay. That was my x plus y distribution. And now I'm happy to have this box. I'm going to go here as an x plus y. I can't use z because I've already used it, right? x1 plus x2, xy plus u. Keep going. I've got the new distribution. Uh, sorry, I want to make this the distribution of u. And that distribution of the product with, of the sum with one additional term. Okay. That's you. That's the result of the previous. And then I want to do that again, and again, and again, and again, each time adding another variable until I have at least systematically giving you the x1 plus x2 plus all on xn sum distribution. And I'm going to want you to illustrate that in class. So I think that, well, I know I built a first lab homework on that, just to see it in your face. What you get 
out of there is that in this specific example, but also more generally, and for things to be relaxed and so on, you ultimately get a smooth, symmetric, never-ending Gaussian curve out of it. And then you might have, so I really like to see it this way, looking increasingly L-shaped, you end up smoothing and spreading the distribution out if you literally just involve boxcars with boxcars with boxcars. And so, yes, that is a heuristic motivation for saying that the normal distribution with the Gaussian distribution is what you get when the effect of many independent, unrelated things compound to give you a variable that is distributed in this normal way. And I do immediately want to have you think about, you know, an error of a measurement or an error of a prediction where you want to look at the distribution. And if your distribution of that error is Gaussian, you will say, well, look, I'm going to argue that there are many non-systematic, random things at play that give me this behavior. And I always run that movie backwards in time to think, aha, that's right. Those are those infinite number of contributing factors that I can't individually characterize, but I know that in the sum, they give me, you know, this conflagration of factors. And that is like, as if I had random stuff happen and then convolve, 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 because every additional effect gives you a successive convolution and you end up at the bell shape. It's not any one thing that matters. It's not something that is particularly interestingly shaped, but formally, it actually ends up being that way. And so that's not a proof, that's not mathematics, but it's something that we're gonna, you know, I want to use that as your first example coding because it is gratifying, satisfying to see. So at this point, I think I should give you, all right, the actual, distribution just to have it written down one. Okay. Is what is the actual Gaussian distribution of the variable? Let me call it Z, you might not. I call it I'm gonna call it X. Okay. And you know part of it. What are the important parts of it? Even if you don't remember writing it down, frankly I never I always need to double check, right? But here's what is important. It's from an exponential family. The argument of the exponent relates the variable of interest x in terms of two of the parameters of the distribution. One of them, mu, and the other of them, a thing I call sigma squared. So it's an exponential two parameter distribution that has this argument, x minus mu, first parameter, divided by two sigma, second parameter, both of these things squared. And then you and I know when you can normalize this thing and if you can do more mathematics than you can do right now, turns out you need to normalize it, or it is normalized when you divide by the square root of two pi and sigma. Nobody can do that integral in his or her or their head. It was Gauss who did that. And that's called the Gaussian integral for that reason, right? If you're gonna take the target distribution, you don't know quite what to normalize and you gotta integrate it, well, that's what Gauss did. He's like, I'm gonna integrate that stuff. And oh, there's square root of pi. Okay? So that gives us a properly normalized distribution. And hopefully it is not a surprise that rather a decent finale here that, well, the integral of px dx between negative infinity and plus infinity is one, I just argued. 
is because we figured out what the normalization factor is, the expectation of the variable. I'm not going to write the integral out, but it is the integral from infinity to infinity plus infinity is x times this p of x integrated over dx. You do not have to do very much work. What is the expectation of an x distributed with a PDF x as written exactly here? Is it mu? It is mu. Uh, Frederick, I think you forgot uh, one over two in the exponential term. Yes, you are definitely right. So I claim this is a Gaussian expression. I have chosen the parameters. I have called it mu like I did mu for my expectation. And so the expectation of x is that mu. So now it's not a hard question anymore, Terry. Variance of x is going to have to be then what? If it all checks out? Sigma squared. Yes, right. OK, so the variance of this, if you plug this all in, which, you know, do it for the fun of it, it better come out as sigma squared. And if I'd forgotten the two, you would have figured out that you'd never get there. But so yeah, there's the two, the square of two pi, and so on. So, and now look again at the argument x minus mu divided by sigma. Remember when I made the daring thing, daringly beautiful graph of correlation. And when I can, you know what? I'm going to subtract my expectation and divide my standard deviation. So that's that, right? So it's like a variable. And I subtract the expectation of the PDF of that variable. And I divide. Yes, there's a scale in there, but you know, divide by the thing. And then I square it. And so all of that in there. But this is x minus mu divided by sigma to the power of two. So that's a distance to its expectation and a scaling by its variance. And that's why we choose the name sigma squared for that, because if we actually do this x minus mu squared px dx integral, in other words, we do get sigma squared out of there. So uh, I'm two minutes late. I'm going to take one more minute of your valuable time and say, all right, well, this Gaussian with these definitions is centered on mu and has a scale that is measured in sigmas. And I'm not drawing this quantitatively. I'm just saying, you know, that's the width of it. And then we can do probabilities and say, well, what is the negative infinity to mu minus three sigma integral? Well, that's like, you know, half a percent. And what is the integral of negative infinity to mu? Well, it's 50%, also the median. Uh, one sigma, two sigma, three sigma. So that's the relevant scaling here on the axis and the relevant shift is that mu, which is why I began with that. And the two sigma, three sigma, then the mass, some of that thing is the 68, 95, 95, 99%. We'll talk about that. Um, but so uh, putting it all together, if you've never ever done it, you might want to take a crack at integrating this and seeing that, you know, it's not that simple. You need a textbook for it to like work through it. Um, but it should check out. It does check out. It's why we've chosen these parameters. So the Gaussian is a two parameter distribution. What are the parameters? We're calling them mu and sigma. Hey, it's convenient. Mu is the expectation and sigma squared is the variance. It does not need any other parameters because the shape, well, the shape is in the constant, the one over two and the power two. And it has complete symmetry. So it's not, <clears throat> it's higher order moments or functions of the lower order moments or zeros. And so they are, um, the whole shape of this curve is completely specified with two free parameters, not counting pi, two, or the powers, you know, like the free parameters, sigma and mu. Um, so this naturally arises this way. It naturally has this form. Now, nobody could have guessed that. There are more mathematics involved than we shouldn't care to do, but we can check that these things work. And then the final thing that I want to start adding on here is that, you know, in the good old surrealist, surrealist tradition, this obviously is not a statement of, but it kind of is, the central limit theorem, which is so much more than what I've just said. 
but I'm going to just give you the Mrs. Frizzle version of it, that when you add variables to a mix of variables and you characterize the sum as a new variable and you ask what the distribution of that thing is, as long as the variables that you shove into that sum are reasonably well behaved, so they're not crazily discontinuous, infinite, you know, massively weird, super unbalanced, but you know, under, you know, conditions, but conditions that you as scientists and engineers and whatever will have no reason to immediately doubt that almost anything can go in and the distribution of the sum variable tends to the Gaussian. Of course, if you shove in weird things, it might take you more tries, more variables until you reach that beautiful Gaussian symmetric shape. But um, it kicks in very rapidly. And so Gaussianity is so central and the central limit theorem is so important because it says that you can get away with almost anything because in their sum, these distributions end up to tend to Gaussianity. And that's why it takes such a central shape. And yeah, I talk about errors in a way that we haven't done you know, before much, but yes, often things are Gaussian. Most of the times they're not Gaussian. Your weight for one thing is not Gaussian because it's not negative or you'd be you know, a helium balloon. So no, but many things are Gaussian. Many randomly distributed, confounded, non-systematic factors like errors in an experiment after fitting it are going to be Gaussian and that whole thing is sort of contained in there, in the central limit term, in the, in the convolution rule, in the shape of the distribution, not favoring any side over the other, and then you link these parameters to the mu's and the sigma that we have chosen and maintained for this reason, because they come right back out of the distribution. 